Good day, this is Professor Resnick again, and I want to continue this uh, uh, presentation of, uh, of Marx in which he is beginning to uh, analyze uh, the business cycle in, in capitalism. Um, so you're continuing to read in, in Volume 1, uh, Capital, that the stuff that has been assigned to you, <coughs> and, and here Marx is beginning to develop um, this, this idea of the business cycle, and once again, to remind where we are, this is in the uh, examination of how capitalists can expand their mass of surplus. So this is the second way that capitalists can do this, and the expanding their mass of surplus, the SV, with the same rate of exploitation, can lead in society to this uh, business cycle. Okay. All right. I want to pick up where I left off last time, if I can remember correctly, which is the capitalists um, have to pay higher uh, uh, prices, costs, for their inputs, uh, not just labor power and means of production, but credit and land and so forth, etc., and that can create problems for them. But then, as I said last time, there's no necessity for those problems to occur. There's no necessity for this downturn. I want to examine that. The first one I want, the first thing I want to focus on is workers. It is true that when there is an expansion, when K star plus lambda um, is positive, that the, the changes in the, in the labor power and the means of production market and other markets as well increase costs to capitalists. But also, we have an increase in market wages of uh, productive and unproductive laborers. Their earnings rise. So on one hand, the increased cost to business, which can may lead to a downturn, occurs along with increased earnings of workers, productive and unproductive in, in, the, in the labor power market, and that can increase the demands for the wage goods and help capitalists expand. So you've got two different things going on in the society, two different consequences of capitalist expansion. Well, to use our language, you two different kinds of overdeterminants which are occurring, okay, which are impacting the economy in these two different ways. Okay, so let me, let me examine analytically uh, this first one. Workers, so I'll let me, so I'm examining the, now the impact on workers. We already went through the cost of the capitalists. Workers get a, um, let's take the per worker. They get a price of labor power equal to the V plus this subsumed class revenue that they're getting per worker. Okay, so this is the this this extra that we had before. This deviation of price from the value of labor power. That was that extra that I had on the blackboard. So let, let's examine all the workers. Okay, so then they get times L times H. That's all the workers times the hours they work. This then is the value of labor power. V times the LH plus this price of labor power minus the V L times H. So I'm multiplying this first equation by L, L times H. Or <coughs> altogether, the workers are getting a value of labor power plus this subsumed class revenue that goes to the workers. And that's the extra subsumed, that's, that's equivalent to the subsumed class payment. That's the same as the subsumed class payment that the capitalists pay to workers. And this is received by workers. Okay? What does this mean? This means now that the workers, all the workers, have higher wages that they can use to go out and purchase consumer goods. So this impacts another market. This is the price of wage goods, V goods. Remember, there's two different kinds of goods. There's C goods and V goods. So this means that, the, that in this supply of V, demand for V, supply of these consumer goods, demand for consumer goods, TV sets, automobiles, and so forth, the demand shifts to the right. Okay, Why? 
because workers have higher incomes. This is their income. So their incomes go up and they can spend more. This implies an increase in the demand for V goods and that's what I just did in this graph. So this is your your uh, uh, TV market, this is your <coughs> automobile market, your food market, your housing market. All these different markets are then affected by the higher incomes and workers demand more and hence the prices of all these goods tend to rise. Okay? By the same logic, by the same logic, this is the you know, uh, Means of, uh, means of subsistence markets, but if we look at the capitalist, you know, enough, the capitalists are receiving higher prices for the stuff that they're selling. So, okay, I, I don't want to lose the logic here. The higher costs to capitalists of purchasing means of production also means that those capitalists that are producing and selling means of production are benefiting from this kind of uh, uh, unequal exchange. So let me take an example that, that when, you're, when you're watching this today. The capitalists who are purchasing energy to produce their uh, uh, commodities okay, have a cost, a higher cost. They have to pay more for the energy. That's a subsumed class payment that they have to make. On the other hand, the higher energy is a benefit to those capitalists who are producing energy. And so they can sell, this, that's what I have here on the whiteboard, they can sell C plus, P, C plus V plus S, they can sell their energy at a higher price, I'll put the C, they can sell their energy at a higher price and they're benefiting from this because they can sell this at a higher price you see that? So that's, that's what we have over here. Uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's another market. Same logic though. Supply of C, demand for C. So here we have the supply of C, we have the demand for C, energy. And the demand has shifted to the right. So the price of oil, price of energy is rising and this is benefiting these producers. So this is an increase in the price of energy. So they, they take their, 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 uh, their uh, uh, energy, they bring it, this is what it costs in value terms, but they can sell it for a higher price. So the, here the deviation is, once again, the price is higher than the, I'm assuming, the unchanged value. And that's then an extra revenue that these capitalist sellers, workers as sellers, capitalists as sellers receive, okay? We focused on the last lecture on the buyers. We're focusing now on the sellers. So what does this mean? Well, the capitalists can sell their stuff for something extra. That's a subsumed class revenue that these capitalists receive, right? Because the other capitalists who are buying the energy, they have to take a cut of their surplus to get access to this energy market and pay higher prices. So the subsumed class payment that they have to pay, that's a subsumed class revenue that these capitalists receive. That's the same logic here. This is a subsumed class revenue that the workers receive, which is a subsumed class payment that these other purchasing capitalists have to make. So notice something. In the capitalists who are selling this stuff, their profits go up. That is, they get a surplus value, but they get this subsumed class revenue. I'll put in my denominator here. So their, I'm going to call this a market rate of profit, their market rate of profit has increased as a result of this expansion. Because this is positive, and hence they're doing better. So the cost to the buying capitalists is the benefit to the selling capitalists. Okay? The cost to the buying capitalists of labor power is the benefit to the uh, uh, sellers of, of labor power. So let me try and put this together now. Okay? And I want to focus on capitalist 
uh, business here, if I may. So I have capitalists who are producing and selling consumer goods. So I'm going to go back now, okay? The workers, the workers have higher incomes, so they are then increasing their demand for wage goods. And we want to ask now, what's the impact on the capitalists who are producing and selling wage goods? I just did that here. This is the impact on the capitalists who are producing and selling means of production. So I want to examine now what's the impact of this on capitalists who are producing and selling wage goods. I'm going to do the same thing now. So this is the capitalists who are producing and selling TV sets. Okay? Who capitalists as sellers of not means of production, but means of subsistence. Capitalists as sellers of means of production. That's this business over here. So these capitalists now, okay, enjoy a wonderful situation in which they can sell their goods, C plus V plus S, that's what it costs them to produce it. So that's what it costs. That's the, remember now, this is the, the, the embodied labor in the C plus the living labor in the V plus S, okay? They can sell these commodities at a price for V higher than what it cost. So the inequality goes this way. That's how they benefit, okay? So they're selling these goods to workers. Workers, by assumption, are individuals who do not appropriate surplus. If they did, that would be communism. Okay? If they produced an appropriate surplus, it would be communism. We're talking about capitalism. So the workers produce the surplus, the capitalists uh, appropriate the surplus. Hence, the workers have to pay higher prices for the... Th the workers have to pay higher prices for these goods. They get higher incomes, but they have to pay higher prices. The capitalists, in turn, are the beneficiaries of this unequal exchange. They can sell their, their apples, what did we have before? Uh, they can sell their apples uh, no longer for, uh, I can't remember the numbers anymore, but uh, they sell their apples no longer for $4, they can sell their apples for $5, a higher price than the value of the apple of, of four bucks, if, if, if those were the numbers. And so the capitalists get a non-class revenue. Okay. This non-class revenue is because they're selling the goods to people who are not capitalists. They are workers. So this has nothing to do with surplus <coughs> by the, the workers because the workers don't appropriate and hence there's no distribution that the workers make out of a, out of a surplus because they don't appropriate the surplus. So the capitalists engage in this, this non-class revenue in which they can sell the TV sets for a higher price than what they cost. So the profit rate of the wage good capitalists increase as well. Okay, so we have capitalists in the means of production market and in the means of uh, subsistence markets who are benefiting. So now if we can try and put this <laughs> complexity together, okay. So let me take my, my capitalists here. So let's start with the capitalists who are operating in the consumer good market. Well, on one hand, they, they get their surplus. So these are capitalists in the consumer goods, means of subsistence, industry. They get their surplus, they pump their surplus out of the workers, but now they're getting a non-class revenue. Bravo. So this is a benefit. This is a, 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 they're earning more because they can sell their V goods greater than the unit value of those goods. That's the result of expansion. They're benefiting here. That's a benefit to them. On the other hand, they have to make their subsumed class payments. Okay, I'm just going to add them all together. Don't forget it has these two components that we've been doing, capital accumulation plus lambda, but I'm just going to lump them together for a moment. 
So this redu reproduces the conditions of existence of this. But they have to make new payments to workers plus new payments to other capitalists. So this is the higher price of labor power greater than the V, little v, of labor power. This is the price of the C good greater than the unit value of the C goods. So what I've done here is take into account the costs on the input side, the extra costs, extra costs on the input side, and the extra benefit on the output side. If you're looking at this like I'm looking at it, you've got to ask the question, which outweighs which? That is, does the inequality go this way? Are they equal, or does it go this way? And frankly, the answer is, I have no idea, and nor does anybody else. You would have to be some kind of god, which we are not, to figure out this complexity. So what we're left with is we don't know. That is, it's possible, it's quite possible, that the costs could exceed the benefit. That is, the shifting of the demands for the inputs to the right could increase costs by so much that it far outweighs the shift in the demand for consumer goods to the right, so the capitalists on net are hurt and they'll contract. But that's no necessity for that. Okay? It could go the other way as well. So you could get not a decline, but an expansion. So we're left with, and of course they could offset one another, the equality. We're left with, you know, rather than we don't know, we're left with a radical degree of uncertainty in capitalism. This system is extraordinarily fragile. That is, the system that everybody believes in and so forth, etc., is an extraordinarily fragile system, and that's what this is indicating here. At any moment, it's teetering on the brink of expansion or decline or a, 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 an equilibrium. The man who came along after Marx died, the man who came along and really focused upon that was not Marx, and he was not a Marxist. His name was John Maynard Keynes, K-E-Y-N-E-S. And Keynes was struck by the uncertainty haunting capitalism. Okay? And he, in his great book, the, uh, that he had he actually had been lecturing in this book for a number of years, that he published in the 1930s, the, you know, the general theory of everything, basically prices, employment, and so forth. There he sets, um, there he sets out an argument of how and of why and how capitalism is fraught with uncertainty. This is different than risk. Fraught with uncertainty, and at any moment, the capitalists, those people sitting on the boards of director, board of directors, who are distributing their profits for K star plus uh, lambda, distributing their gross profits for those two two items, the K star plus lambda, can decrease or expand because of a variety of different events occurring in capitalism. Uh, he summar Keynes summarized these variety of different events as animal spirits. And the animal spirits in society could push the capitalists to decrease K star. Okay, for, let me give you an example of this. Okay. Suppose it were the case that the inequality was going this way. Okay, so that the Capitalists were benefiting more on the output side um, uh, from rising uh, incomes than they were paying on the uh, cost side. Okay, so things look pretty good. That very advantage to the capitalists could create in them positions of worry that it's not going to continue. They have learned by now about these business cycles. The board of directors hire managers in the corporation who worry about this, that's part of their job, to be risk adverse, let's say. So that the, when the very expansion is occurring and things look good, the capitalists begin to worry, because they've had an experience in this, that they have to be careful. So they begin to hedge their bets, because they're worried about the future, okay? Because they don't know what's gonna happen, so they begin to worry about it, and it's a prudent capitalist who would begin to hedge his or her bets, so that they, they don't invest all of their surplus 
in K Star. They don't hire more managers in Lambda. Rather, they take a portion of that surplus and they purchase, well, whatever, let's say in the United States, they purchase government securities. Okay, it's just that they begin to do that. Well, it need not be only one capitalist. Okay, as all capitalists begin to do that, that very uh, diversification of their expenditures from K-star plus lambda to holding money or holding government secu uh, securities or holding gold or whatever the case may be, that in and of itself diminishes K-star plus lambda from what it would be otherwise, and that can cause a recession. So if I put together the very expansion can make capitalists hedge their bets, worried about if this is going to continue, and cut back K-star plus lambda from what it would be otherwise, but the very cutback can create problems. Remember, remember what, if you had a course in macroeconomics and it's part of Keynesian analysis, the very cutbacks of these capitalists has a, have a multiplier effect with them uh, throughout the economy. So if they cut back by you know, 40, 50 billion dollars, it can have a magnified, much more than that, impact up upon the economy. Let me give you another one. It's quite possible, whatever is the inequality here, for something to occur in the economy which makes the capitalist euphoric or makes the capital depressed. Euphoric. Uh, a new discovery of uh, a way to produce energy makes them happy. They increase their K-star plus lambda, even if the inequality is going like this. Because they've become so happy that, that even the, in the face of this extra cost, they will, they're willing to take on uh, uh, more, more risk because all of a sudden they feel good now about what they think is going to be the future. On the other hand, it's also possible that a fall in stock prices could get them so scared that they cut back in case star plus lambda even if the inequality is going this way. That is, the, the fall in a stock price which may have absolutely nothing to do with this particular industry. Okay, because that's, a, that's an effect in the stock market. But if the stock market falls, that can change the mood of capitalists from euphoria to becoming dour and worried about the future, and hence they can diminish their K star plus lambda times the multiplier. It has an impact upon the economy. That's the great Keynesian contribution to, to analyzing uh, business investment you know, in a capitalist economy. It's continually being pushed and pulled I'm going to use my language now, not Keynes. It's continually being overdetermined by the ideas of the capitalists of what's going to happen um, in the future. And anything can change that, and therefore, that is, can change their, their ideas about the future and hence change their case star plus lambda. Okay? So, if, they, if it goes this way, well, the expansion will continue, and there's no necessity for the decline. If it goes this way, then you will have a contraction. Okay. And so we need to add the uncertainty into this. And let me just, to, for, to complete this, uh, this was capitalists in the consumer good industry. We also can add to this capitalists, so this is one analysis, capitalists in means of production industries. By the same logic here, they get a surplus, okay, and I'm, I'm uh, picking up what we did last time, plus a subsumed class revenue. Remember, because they're selling their means of their oil at a greater price than its unit value. That's what this, they're selling it to other capitalists. Okay. And here again, we don't know the sign. We have the uncertainty on the part of this part of the economy as well, because they have to make their subsumed class payments for this. But in terms of, of uh, uh, this benefit, we have the cost they have to make subsumed class payments to the workers. I'm going to leave this term off because uh, the ca these capitalists are producing the means of production, so it doesn't make any sense that is it where they're producing and selling it to themselves. But they still have to pay a higher price of labor power to the workers. So I don't know, and nor do you, and nor does anyone else what the sign is in. This is as uncertain as the sign here. So we have in the two great industries in capitalism, the wage good industry and the means of production industry. Marx in volume three of Capital 
calls the wage good industry department two, and calls the capital good industry the means of production department one. So in the two great departments, department one, means of production, department two, wage good industries, these two great departments, we have this uncertainty, and it's possible at any moment for it to go one way or the other. So let me uh, summarize all this. I, let me get rid of this. Capitalist, capitalist expansion, K star plus lambda is going up. That increases the demands for labor power. That increases the demands for means of production. So we have K star plus lambda increasing. That's our expansion. That has impacts on the labor market. That increases the demand for labor power, increases the demand for means of production. So that's our case start. But that also increases the demand for credit, increases the demand for land, increases the demand for uh, managers, and so forth and so forth, etc. So that's our impact on these, on these markets. Then, as I argued with you, this in turn implies increases of prices for labor power, increase in prices of means of production, increase in prices of credit, interest rate, increases in, in the rents, increase in the salaries of managers, as those markets get impacted. And it's possible then that this result here, over here, it's possible that this could lead to a contraction. Because you have set in motion these inflationary conditions in the economy, and at any moment, that could end up with a contraction and the demands for labor power and means of production and managers and so forth can start shifting back to the, to the left. You have that reserve army, the unemployment, argument of, of, of Marx. So you have the possibility of crisis for capitalism, contraction, crisis for capitalism. As a result of its expansion, that is, the costs of, of production rise and the cost of those individuals who enable production also rise. Okay, the enabler is uh, over here, and then the direct inputs into production over here. So the contraction is the crisis for capitalism as a result of its, ex of its expansion. Okay? And then case stop plus lambda falls, implying the rise sets in motion the conditions of existence for the fall, the business cycle. Okay? On the other hand, this need not happen. There's no necessity for this. Why? Because this very increase may increase supplies of labor power. What's that all about? I'll do that next time. What that is about is that there may be um, uh, immigration into a country. So the supply of labor power may shift to the right. In the United States, women may enter the labor force, leave the household, and that'll shift the supply of labor power to the right. Okay? But you also can have um, increase in the demand for uh, means of production, increase in the demand for uh, uh, wage goods. This is C goods and V goods. Okay? And that can serve to have capitalists um, expand. And I'm going to show you next time um, when this happens, that expansion, that very expansion in these markets may set in motion a shift in supply of goods and services. Okay. You can also have changes in technology such that the demand for labor power doesn't shift to the right as much. It, doesn't sh it shifts, but it doesn't shift to the right as much as expected. What's that all about? That's a rise in the composition of capital. 
that's C over C plus V, um, may rise. You can have the state stepping in to offset the rising interest rate by increasing the supply of credit, the supply of money in the society to offset an increased um, interest rate. That's what the state is doing now. You can have um, 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 imports of new means of production. That is, the supply of means of production would shift to the right. And of course, imports, increased imports of V-goods, such that the supply of, of, uh, of uh, automobiles shifts to the right, and hence there's less of a tendency for the prices to rise, and you don't get this. So in other words, it's quite possible, to put all this together, to have offsetting effects in all these different markets so, for, uh, so that the uh, you know, recession um, uh, does not occur. And that's what I'm going to examine next time, is these, the possibility of these different shiftings, so we get a much more nuanced and sophisticated analysis and understanding of an economy and how, again, it's being pushed and pulled in these different directions by the very capitalist expansion which is set in motion. Thank you.